Welcome DGS Biology students. This is Mr. Gales and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about the science of the microscope or as we call it microscopy. On this title slide you see three different types of microscopes. The microscope farthest to the left is a representation of a late 1600s microscope. This would be an example of a microscope that was used by a scientist named Robert Hooke. And you can see the kind of detail that Hooke was able to observe using this microscope. Obviously this is a somewhat primitive microscope based on today's standards, but we were able to for the first time see individual cells. Microscope in the middle is the kind of microscope that we will be using in class. It's called a compound light microscope. It allows us to see fairly good cellular details. We can magnify objects up to about 400 times with the microscopes that we use in class. And then finally to the right, we have what's called an electron microscope. Now electron microscopes are extremely special. They allow us to magnify hundreds of thousands of times uh, to pr produce extremely vivid images of very minute details. All right, so we have these three major types of microscopes. In this presentation, we're really gonna focus on the compound light microscope there in the middle. Before we get going, make sure that you have your note pages so that you can be taking down notes on key ideas and that you jot down any questions that you have so that we can talk about them in class. So let's begin with the invention of the microscope. The microscope is really a Renaissance invention. Uh, the Renaissance was an interesting period in history. Uh, in Europe, we were coming out of the, the Dark Ages, the, the, the time of war and famine and disease and death. Uh, it was a very bleak time in Europe. And then the Renaissance begins when, when the conditions in Europe improve. Uh, there's a period of peace or relative peace. There's uh, freedom from the plague. Uh, so more attention could be turned to understanding the world and less attention was needed just simply on survival. Uh, other inventions that were um, made during the Renaissance would include the printing press, um, gunpowder, the mariner's compass for using during um, seagoing expeditions. But the microscope is, is really most important for us in science. It's obviously the basis for being able to investigate the cell, which is the basic unit of life. Credit for, going, uh, for inventing the microscope goes to a Dutch merchant by the name of Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, Leeuwenhoek is oftentimes referred to as the father of the microscope because he's really the first one who popularizes uh, and, and mass produces microscopes. Leeuwenhoek was by trade a merchant. He traded in fine oriental silks and, and carpets and rugs and he wanted to be able to prove to his customers that he had the finest quality cloth. So he was, he started off by simply constructing simple curved glass lenses and using them as we would use a magnifying glass to be able to magnify very, very simply uh, the cloth that he was looking at. And he found that he, when he was able, when he used them in combination, he was able to get even greater detail and greater magnification. So he constructed a simple, very simple curved glass lens combination microscope. And we see the picture of that here in the middle. Obviously it looks very different from the kinds of microscopes that we're used to today, but Leeuwenhoek using this microscope was able to make fairly detailed drawings of organisms like you see here. This, these are actual drawings that Leeuwenhoek made of flea anatomy. So Anton von Leeuwenhoek is the father of the microscope, obviously a very big step in the history of biology. Now, improving the microscope was really important for us to be able to get even better insight into the cell as the basic unit of life. Uh, one of the, the scientists that's most credited with really improving the microscope and really using it systematically was a guy named Robert Hooke. This is an English biologist who is famous for discovering cells. As a matter of fact, he's the one that names what we now know as the basic unit of life a cell. And uh, what he did is he increased, he was able to increase the magnification of his microscopes by using improved lenses. He had, he had worked on and improved the ability to grind these curved lenses and then produce them uh, in a way that he could put them together in combination in a way that's much more familiar to us today. If we look at this microscope, it still is quite different from what we use in class, but it, you have the familiar eyepiece and you have the familiar objective lens that, you, that we, you know, we would use today. 
Interestingly, obviously there's no electrical light source. So what Hook would do is he used an oil lamp that he would burn to produce light. And then that light would be concentrated through water. And, and that would be uh, shown upon the specimen that he was looking at. So this was really a big step forward, this, this improved microscope, and it allowed for the development of what we call the cell theory. Robert Hooke was, the again, the, the person most credited with discovering cells and naming cells, and he's also the scientist responsible for the first part of cell theory that we'll talk about in our cell unit, and that is that all living things are made of cells. Well, when we look at modern compound light microscopes, they've obviously come a very long way. This is the kind of microscope that we use in class, and so the parts uh, will and the, their functions will become very familiar to you over the next week or so. Some basic information about compound light microscopes that you'll need to know about is that they derive their name, compound light microscope, from using two lenses in combination to magnify an image. Okay, we have an image in the ocular lens or eyepiece, and then we have a lens down here in the objectives, and those two lenses together work in combination to produce a greater total magnification. Modern compound light mic microscopes allow us to view objects that are too small to be seen with unaided eye. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we can in, the microscopes that we'll use in class magnify anywhere from 40 times all the way up to about 400 times, so we're going to be able to see very small structures that we would not be able to see with our, our naked eye. One thing that you need to be aware of is when we're looking at specimens, the object that we want to take a look at, the specimen, must be thin enough for light to pass through. So when using a compound light microscope, we're not going to be able to look at, for instance, like a dime or a, a, a coin, because those are metal pieces, light can't shine through them, and therefore the light can't be transmitted through the lens system to our eyes, and it is... Uh, you know, will not provide an image for us. There is a kind of microscope that we can use, then we will use later on in the unit, which is called a stereoscope, and that's going to allow us to uh, look at the three-dimensional features of, of objects that are a little larger or perhaps a little thicker. One nice thing about compound light microscopes is we can view living things. If we were to take a sample of pond water from our pond in the courtyard, we could take that, put that under the compound light microscope, and we would be able to see different kinds of, of microorganisms that are called protists. These are um, organisms that might be familiar to you, like the amoeba or the paramecium. Again, typical magnification for a compound light microscope is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times. The microscopes that we will use in class uh, have magnifications. Uh, 40 times is the total magnification scanning lens uh, combination. When we work in low power, the total magnification will be 100 times, and then in high power, the total magnification will be 400 times. All right, the parts of the microscope, you need to make sure that you understand what each part is. You should be able to identify them and then what each part does. The ocular lens is what we look through. It's more commonly referred to as the eyepiece. Most ocular lenses have a, a magnification of 10x. The arm is there to support, obviously, the upper part of the microscope, and we use that to carry the microscope when transporting. The stage is used for supporting the slide. It's where the slide sits. We usually place the slide here, and there are, are stage clips that we can use to uh, keep the slide in place. The course adjustment knob, also referred to as the big wheel, uh, is the, the adjustment knob that we use to rapidly move the stage up and down. It allows us to uh, rapidly move our object into what we call the focal plane, or into the proper viewing distance from the lenses. The find adjustment knob that we see here, the smaller of the two knobs, is for sharp focus. So typically you're only going to use the find adjustment knob when you're in high power. Now conversely, uh, the course adjustment knob really would only be used when you're in scanning or in low power. We never use the course adjustment knob in high power because it makes uh, very rapid adjustments and you could easily break the, the lens or the, um, the slide that you're looking at. Base is obviously what supports the microscope. Again, we use that to carry the microscope, one hand on the base and one hand on the arm when moving the microscope. We have light source in our modern compound light microscopes. That light source is a lamp. Diaphragm underneath the stage is what we use to adjust the amount of light that enters the lens system. Uh, this is what's called an iris diaphragm. The microscopes that we use in class are called disc diaphragms, and you can change the amount of light by changing the size of the opening on that diaphragm. 
uh, objective lenses. These are the lenses that we use in combination with the ocular lens to get our total magnification. And our microscope that we'll use in class has three different objective lenses. Uh, the objective lenses that we'll use, the red lens, the, the lens that has the red band around it is called the scanning lens. That lens has a magnification of 4x. Uh, the way we calculate total magnification is we use the objective lens times the eyepiece lens magnification. That gives us total magnification. So 4x for scanning times 10x for the ocular gives us a total magnification of 40x when we're using scanning. We are always going to start with the scanning lens. It gives us the, the best opportunity to find our specimen, and it provides us with the largest field of view to work with. The objective lens that has the yellow band around it is the low power lens, and that has a magnification of 10x. So in combination with our ocular lens, which also has a magnification of 10x, the two together, we multiply those two numbers, we get a total magnification of 100x. And then finally, our high power lens, the microscopes that we have in class have a blue band around the high power lens. And that blue band, that, that high power lens magnification is 40x. So when we combine that with the 10x from the ocular lens, that gives us a total magnification or high power of 400x. Those objectives are attached to what's called a revolving nose piece. And that revolving nose piece allows you to snap into place the appropriate objective lens, depending on what what you're looking at and, and what stage you are in terms of your viewing. The body tube, uh, the body tube is what the lens system uh, is attached to and the light obviously travels through there from the objective lenses to the ocular lens. So that's a quick rundown on the parts of the microscope and what they do. Um, our job in the next couple of days is going to be to make sure that you know how to use the microscope appropriately to make observations. And to that end, if you check on page 17 of your packet, there's a detailed discussion of the parts and their functions, which we've already gone over, proper use and handling, and then also the procedures for making a wet mount of a uh, specimen that you'd like to take a look at. So that's all for now. We're going to begin working on a, a lab that is going to have you practicing using the microscope appropriately. And when we're done with that lab, we'll turn our attention to a few other types of microscopes, namely the electron microscope and the stereoscopic microscope. Okay, that's all for now. Make sure again if you've got questions that you've uh, that were brought up during this this uh, uh, this screencast that you didn't have answered. Make sure you write them down. Make sure you've got your notes. Bring them to class with you, and anything that you need to discuss, we can talk about those things in class. All right, this is Mr. Gale signing off. We'll see you in class.